Um, so I'm going to present my research, which is based on fieldwork that I conducted in Crimea in 2012 and 2013. And what I want to do is reflect on what this data tells us about um, kind of dynamics on the ground today, and also the kind of shifting perspective about what Crimea looked like in 2012, 2013, and then this kind of radical shift um, in 2014. And I have kind of two objectives in this. The first is, uh, from a social science perspective, I think it's important <coughs> for social scientists to scrutinize um, kind of taking for granted assumptions. And the taking for granted assumption I want to question today is that Crimea was um, homogeneously a, a region of kind of Russian ethnic majority, and from that, that Crimea was a region of kind of pro-Russian um, sentiment, if not separatist uh, sentiment as well. And the second um, kind of perspective that I want to, to use is the kind of political perspective, which says that if we can crit uh, criticize the, the kind of legal um, framework in which Crimea was annexed by Russia, but we still, uh, this is kind of based on an assumption that, you know, Crimea was that Crimeans would have kind of voted in this way anyway if the election had been free and fair. And I think that we don't have evidence of that, and I think it's very important for us to, to also criticise that um, assumption as well. Um, so just to kind of give you an outline of the presentation, I'm going to look at some existing identity debates in post-Soviet Crimea to, to argue why I think it's important to have this kind of bottom-up um, lived experience perspective, and then I'm going to explain what I mean by that and the methodology of, of the research. And then I'm going to look at two aspects in Crimea, to look at identity from the bottom up, and in particular the, the meanings of Russian identity, and also territorial aspirations um, from the bottom up. And I want to look also at the association between identity and territorial um, preferences. And I want to start uh, with a quote, and I'm going to come back to this quote at the end of my presentation in kind of the bigger context of the research. But I think that this shows uh, the situation as it was on the ground in 2012 that we're not talking about the fact that Crimea should secede. This isn't a, a kind of objective that we have. And even I would argue that the, the, the notion of secession in, in Crimea in 2012 and 2013 was quite farcical. I mean, no one believes that Russia really wanted Crimea, and Crimeans certainly didn't um, aspire uh, to be part of, of Russia at that time. And one of the reasons I argue is that this was framed within a kind of conflict. We can only imagine secession if... Uh, through this kind of conflictual, bloodshed, cataclysm kind of situation. And so what we see is, is kind of this path-dependent idea about the way in which Crimea and, and respondents imagined Crimea to be part of Ukraine and the legitimacy that came with that, and this idea that any kind of rupture from that uh, had to in be incurred via this kind of cataclysm and conflict um, situation. So just to move to some kind of perspectives, and this is a, a very kind of broad overview of how I see Crimea has been framed um, by previous research, that it's very much framed through this idea that Crimea was a kind of a region populated by ethnic Russian um, communities. And, and on the other side, then, there were kind of minorities of ethnic Ukrainians and, and Crimean Tatars. And this set up Crimea as very much kind of mutually exclusive terms, that you had these kind of separate um, communities. And because Crimea was this kind of ethnic Russian community, it was also seen as very kind of anomalously different to Ukraine. And that meant either that Crimea was kind of subsumed within bigger uh, Russian identity debates within Ukraine, or kind of ignored, and deliberately ignored to an extent. If Crimea is so different, then it's better that we don't include it within these kind of Ukrainian studies of, of Russian identity, because it's not seen as kind of representative of bigger trends. And on this basis, Crimea was uh, seen as kind of necessarily and uncritically Russian, and from that, pro-Russian and pro-Russia. Uh, if not, there were many assumptions also about the ways in which, um, of course, many Russian passport holders reside in Crimea. And I'm not arguing that there weren't Russian passport holders in Crimea, but I would argue that Crimea was not a region of passportization, based on the idea that, that Russian passports among the people that I interviewed in Simferopol in 2012 and 2013 were seen as undesirable and un inaccessible. Um, so I think we also need to distinguish between Crimea and, and Sevastopol, because I think there are very different uh, dynamics there as well. And then we have some other kind of perspectives that uh, could... That kind of blur the idea between Russians and Ukrainians and this kind of single Slavic actor, um, which I think is an interesting kind of counter perspective on the ethnic uh, mutually exclusive um, communities. And then this idea that actually uh, secession was a kind of declining um, political sentiment among uh, Crimean residents, and that after 1994 what we see is actually that was the kind of apex of secession sentiment, and after that it was kind of declining. And the people uh, supporting these kind of separatist ideas were kind of marginal political actors in Crimea. And these are some of the ideas that I want to uh, draw out in the presentation. So what we see <laughs> when we kind of look at the maps, and I think these maps are kind of very much how Crimea, uh, Ukraine is characterized, is that firstly, uh, Crimea is very different to, to other regions of Ukraine. 
uh, in terms of Russian language, more similar to Donetsk and Luhansk. But this gives a very kind of totalizing and homogenizing view of Crimea, as if, well, Crimea is just this region where 60 to 70 percent of people speak Russian, and that's it. And again, in terms of ethnicity, Crimea is this region of 50 to 60 percent ethnic Russians. But what I want to argue is that we don't really know what this means to be Russian in Crimea. We don't know how that identity is experienced. We don't know how this identity is experienced vis-a-vis -vis, uh, identifying as Ukrainian or Crimea, or what this means about how individuals situate themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis Crimea, Ukraine, and Russia. And that's some of the ideas I want to bring about. And we also don't really understand much about how territorial preferences are imagined by everyday Crimean actors. We don't know if there was support for the status quo, separatism, or identity. Um, often, being Russian is seen as a kind of determining of, of your loyalties and of your kind of passport desires, as opposed to the kind of legitimacy that might come from being an ethnic Russian within Ukraine. Um, so just to very, very briefly uh, discuss some of the methodology. So it's bottom-up, it's agency-centered, and I'm interested in the meanings and experiences of, of everyday actors uh, existing in Crimea. And what I tried to do in the 53 interviews that I conducted was to have a very broad spectrum across the political spectrum, across the social spectrum. Um, that doesn't mean that I wasn't engaging with political actors. I was in particular interested in kind of youth wings of political parties to get this kind of bottom-up perspective. And um, it's not a kind of elite versus mass perspective in that sense. It's more this kind of how is being Russian uh, experienced by different people across these kind of political and social spectrums. And so what I don't do is argue that my research is representative. I argue that I actually, you know, I can't claim representativeness as a very small sample. What I'm interested in is more this kind of depth and breadth, so the richness of perspectives and, and the, the different ways across the political and social spectrums that these identities are experienced. So as I explained in the beginning, I'm going to look at territory from the, uh, identity from the bottom up and then territory from the bottom up and look at the kind of associations um, between those. So when I returned um, from the field in 2013, I had uh, a diversity of different perspectives on what being Russian meant, and I had to, kind, uh, to come up with some way of conceptualizing these different ways. And I came up with these inductively derived categories, uh, which I formed out of the ways in which uh, respondents agreed or disagreed. And, and so I kind of inductively derived these five categories, which um, in some ways idealize uh, the, the, the sense of agreement, but I also think there are interesting dis uh, disagreements between the categories as well. So the discriminated Russians uh, were the kind of most pro-Russian, and they identified not only as Russian, but also very much kind of victimized and threatened by the Ukrainian state. Ethnic Russians, on the other hand, identified primarily as ethnically Russian, but this was expressed without a feeling of discrimination and often accompanied by this kind of legitimate sense that they, they resided in Ukraine and didn't feel marginalized um, on that basis were kind of happy to, to reside in Ukraine. And then political Ukrainians, for me, are kind of one of the most interesting categories um, because they shunned ethnic identity. They didn't want to identify themselves in ethnic terms. They often identified their parents as ethnically Russian, but they didn't really want to kind of buy into that ethnicized way of thinking, and instead identified themselves as citizens of Ukraine. And these were often kind of post-Soviet generation. Ukraine was the state, the only state that they had really experienced, um, and, and so they didn't feel themselves as Russian, they didn't identify as Russian in any way. Um, and then Crimeans, again, are interesting because they, uh, again, blur these kind of mutually exclusive ethnic identity car um, categories, identifying as kind of somewhere in between Ukrainian and Russian, uh, both territorially, because they saw Crimea as between these uh, two territories, and also uh, in a familial sense, because they often had uh, kind of families from both Ukraine and Russia identifying as both um, Russian and Ukrainian. And then ethnic Ukrainians are kind of the contrast group as the only category who identifies um, as Ukrainian on the basis of kind of effort, linguistically and culturally being Ukrainian. And I'm going to focus now on just two categories to kind of flesh out some of these on the basis of the quotes that I have. And, and I'm going to talk about, firstly, discriminated Russians. I think it's important to, to point out um, that discriminated Russians, for me, are a very politicized category because they're not only identifying as, as kind of uh, victims of Ukraine, but they're also political actors. They're the, the people who are associated with Ruska Yedinsva, Ruska Shina Klima, and these, incidentally, are the same organizations that I would argue are very uh, important in facilitating Crimea's, or at least endorsing on the ground, Crimea's annexation in 2014. And we see that with a kind of catapulting of, uh, of their leaders, Sergei Tsyonov, um, to, the, to the kind of Crimea position in Crimea. So it's not just that they identify as, forced, uh, as kind of victims of forced Ukrainianization. It's not just that they're buying into that discourse. They're also trying to appeal to the people uh, for whom that discourse appeals, which is primarily, I would argue, kind of uh, pensioners in, in Crimea. And so they don't just feel marginalized. They're also trying to kind of uh, tap into that sense of marginalization. And I think it's important then to see this 
uh, discriminated Russian uh, category is kind of very politically motivated in that sense. And so the contrast uh, with that is, as I said, the, the kind of political Ukrainians who identified as Ukrainian and very much saw this as a kind of post-Soviet identity. To them, previously, you could only be Ukrainian in the Crimea if you had been born outside of, of Crimea. But for them, having born in, been born inside Crimea or kind of even in Russia, but it, having this political experience of, of being Ukrainian, this was the basis on which they, they identified and associated themselves. And I think what's really important was that they didn't see ethnicity as something that really determined their lives. This was a socioeconomic concern. Citizens live badly. It's not determined from, from ethnicity or nationality in that sense. OK, great. Uh, OK, so very quickly. Um, so when we come to, to territorial aspirations, what I think is really interesting is that among the categories uh, that I constructed, uh, virtually nobody supported separatism. In 2012 and 2013, separatism was uh, either um, kind of undesirable for the discriminated Russians who supported peace, or uh, undesirable to the extent that Crimea for them was seen as a very kind of legitimate part of Ukraine. That wasn't to say they didn't want reform in terms of Crimea's relations with, with Ukraine or in terms of the geopolitical uh, configuration of Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but they didn't support separatism. And so I'm going to go back to the quote um, that I started with, because I think it's interesting when I now contextualize this as a quote from a discriminated Russian from, uh, from political actors who would become part of this secession movement in 2014, that in 2012 and 2013, uh, secession was not a political aspiration or a political goal um, of these actors. Again, it was impossible to make without bloodshed, and here I kind of go to some of Leighton's work, that for them it was better to have a kind of bad peace, this kind of situation where they were imagining the future as kind of being marginalized within Crimea but still residing in, in Ukraine, to the kind of unknown uh, sense that secession would bring and, and this kind of bloodshed and, and cataclysm. So just to conclude, um, what I want to, to argue is that the notion of a Russian majority in Crimea before 2014 was highly fractured and contested, and I think it's important that we don't kind of uh, totalize what it meant to be Russian in Crimea um, before Russian annexation, and that there was overwhelming support for territorial status quo, really in a very kind of path-dependent way. Why would um, individuals aspire for something that they imagined that would have such grave consequences, um, and very different consequences to what we actually see um, happening in 2014? And I'm just going to end um, with an image that haunts me that I took in uh, 2011, this image of uh, Russians are coming. Because in 2011, 2012, and 2013, the perception on the ground was that Russians weren't coming. Um, you see this is the Ruska Yedinska uh, poster of Russian unity, Sergei Sona's party, and you see this kind of sticker over the top. This shows the ways in which these actors were very marginalized uh, in the political sphere in, in Crimea before 2014. And the, the big difference then between this marginalization before annexation and afterwards when they were kind of catapulted uh, to the centers of power. And, and the ways in which secession was seen as a kind of failed movement from the 90s and the ways in which uh, those actors that supported secession were both kind of marginalized and in themselves were not aspiring for those goals um, anymore, but kind of more working within this kind of discriminated uh, rhetoric that we see um, 